Welcome back to Candle Against the Dark. Now, when we left Jack, he was back in the relative safety of his automo. He had acquired the recorder um, upon which he recorded all of these, uh, everything we've been listening to. And he has the box set of Ash's music um, and, and the briefcase um, in which all of these things came to us. Orson? Correct. Uh, speaking of the recorder, uh, that's probably the most important aspect of the moment because we've reached a point in Jack's telling where, uh, at least from his point of view, everything is in the present. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's an immediacy now, which we'll begin to feel. Uh, mm-hmm. So, well, let's see what he has to say. Okay. All right, well, it's been a long road getting here, but we finally arrived. I've told you everything now, everything I know, everything that's happened. And now that I have, I'm honestly not really sure what to do with myself. Now I feel like I'm in a holding pattern, just waiting, you know, waiting for some indication of what's supposed to happen next, what they have planned for me, just sitting here in the cold and the dark, awaiting instructions like a dutiful little drone talking into this recorder, the one that they saw fit to equip me with. But, you know, that's fine. I'll happily sit here and wait. I'll do their bidding. I'll follow their cues. Because every moment I'm allowed to remain alive is a moment closer to the answer I want. The longer I'm here, the more data I can collect. I have no idea where I am. There was no sign welcoming me into whatever town I finally drifted into. But at least the fog has lifted. Instead, there's a completely overcast sky looming over everything now. There's no stars, no moon. Just this bizarrely illuminated ceiling of clouds. It wasn't long after my encounter at Allmart that the fog just kind of abruptly dissipated around me. Or at least it didn't feel very long, not like the eternity it was before. I think I was so caught up in trying to make sense out of what had just happened, you know, the puzzle of what exactly this recorder and box set meant, that at least for a little while, my emotional bleeding was staunched. I was thinking a little more clearly. And that's when I finally started to wrap my head around this whole notion of there being some kind of plan for me. And again, not that I had at the time or even now any earthly idea what that plan was or is, but there's still something weirdly hopeful about realizing that one must exist, that there is, in fact, a reason I can now chase that will explain the need for my pain, for Scylla's. And even if the reason I discover is wholly unfair and unjust, which, given everything, I think is more than safe to assume, I still find that somehow more preferable than the alternative. Because the only other explanation is sheer emptiness, complete meaninglessness, and chaos. And as I weighed everything on that drive, I felt like I'd ruled that out, at least. And that realization, that pathetic little hope, lightened me a little as I drove. You know, it's strange how willing we are to move the goalpost in the face of overwhelming suffering. How we'll grasp at anything that gives us even a modicum of purpose or meaning. And it doesn't even matter how artificial it is. I mean, rationally, I know there being some specific reason for all of this doesn't make it any less horrific. But that doesn't seem to matter to me at all on the more visceral, experiential level. I guess I'm just like everyone else now, at the mercy of what I feel. You know, programmed to feel and driven by the desires those feelings create. I mean, I think we've always been a species that felt more comfortable, more accepting of our fates, when everything has a sense of organization behind it. And seeking any evidence of that order has always been a profound, if not the most central, desire for humankind. I mean, it's clearly the driving force behind every religion we've ever had. In fact, I think all of them, every religion, can fundamentally be summed up rather neatly with one tired little platitude. 
everything happens for a reason. And as much as that has never appealed to me before, as hollow as that has always seemed to me, somehow it's enough to keep me going now. Because now I've decided I need to know why. Because that feels like my inherent right. I mean, it's become the only thing lighting the path ahead of me. And you know what? I'll take it. But not because I think that it'll make any of this any less horrific in the end. I know no reason will ever suffice. But I see my surrender to the search for one as a sort of hack You know, I'll use the programming I've been saddled with to keep me moving. I'll let the seductive power of my self-righteous need propel me forward until I find those responsible. Because after everything I need, I demand the opportunity to come face to face with whatever is behind all of this. And I know that any sense of justice I'll get from that confrontation is really just an illusion. You know, that it won't really matter once I'm gone because I'll be gone and it won't have changed reality one iota. But I don't give a shit because I'm angry and I refuse to die without saying my fucking peace. I will not just go gentle into this good night they have created for us. Rebellion, no matter how futile, is all I have left. Which is funny because... I also know that a true act of rebellion, the only one with any chance of actually being effective, would be to remove any possibility of me carrying out whatever they have in store for me. You know, killing myself would definitely put a wrench in their works. But for all I know, they just adapt to that circumstance and my death would be reduced to nothing but an unfortunate and ultimately irrelevant kink in their timeline. And that just isn't good enough for me. And I think they probably already know that, that I'm just a prisoner of survival instinct and the very human desire for justice. So here I sit. Where here is exactly is kind of anybody's guess, but I suppose it doesn't really matter in the end. Judging by the desert terrain around me, I know that I am very, very far from where my journey began. But... As far as I have obviously traveled, it all still feels strangely the same. You know, subdivisions and cul-de-sacs surrounded by strip malls and chain restaurants. And just as I'm sure is true of my former home, everything here is dead, withered and desiccated, a shell of the lives it once housed. And all that's left is the slowly crumbling infrastructure a carcass of scattered bones, the bones of suburbia. I've taken up residence in a stylish little craftsman. It's really quite nice. And it even came complete with two dried up corpses, the former owners, I'm assuming. And aside from those bodies and the shards of the dead nodes littering the family room floor, I'd actually call it an inviting home. That said, I have decided to stick largely to the garage. I mean, I know it doesn't make any sense and that they aren't really here to care anymore, but I just don't feel right about living in their space. I mean, I know what it feels like to have your life invaded by those who don't belong, and I just can't bring myself to do that to them. And judging by the photos lovingly placed around the house, they were a nice, happy couple. So I'll let them rest in peace. I do need to venture out. You know, what little food I was able to find in their cupboards didn't last long. But it's a big neighborhood, so I'm sure I'll find plenty more rations. But first, I need to try to get some sleep. I don't even know when I actually slept last. It was before all of this, so a long time. And even now that I'm somewhere relatively safe, I'm still struggling. I seem to always get just up to that edge of legitimate deep sleep. And then I'm jolted awake again, smacked in the face with the flashes of the horror of Scylla's final moments. Or at least those moments I was actually there to witness, you know, before I ran like a coward and left her there to die alone. And with that thought, I think I've probably just guaranteed another failed attempt at sleep. 
The phrase, I'll sleep when I'm dead, has a whole new meaning to me these days. <laughs> anyway, I'm signing off. More later. Okay. Uh, well, I think we can uh, safely say that we are uh, over the rainbow at hmm. this point, uh, so to speak. Uh, for Jack, the fog has, uh, well, it's, it's literally lifted here. Mm -hmm. The clouds are overhead now, uh, blocking out the sky, and they appear to have taken on some sort of uh, glow. Right. Uh, it's a strange sight, but Jack is clearly focused on other things at this uh, point. I, w I would say so. Um, it, one thing he does seem to be carrying with him, and, and it's really sad uh, to me that he, he considers himself a coward, uh, because he left his wife behind. And and it, it just really feels like an unfair accusation uh, against himself that he's, that he's carrying, clinging to this notion that if he had been brave, somehow things would have ended differently. And I, I, I just don't think that's the case. Uh, it, it's, like his, it's like his mind is, is desperately trying to spin this narrative uh, in which he had uh, more agency than than he actually did, uh, or or does now, for that matter. Yes, it's a it's a it's a uh, retrofitted hope right. onto the situation. Right. Uh, uh, but you know, these are the kind of things that you uh, most people never come to terms with. Mm -hmm. uh, I doubt it's the kind of thing that he's gonna going to, uh, you know, exactly work out on a nice leisurely drive through a fog bank. Indeed. I think we do have to recognize that uh, in spite of the distractions that he's surrounded by, it's an admirable amount of self-reflection that he's doing. Indeed. Well, um, speaking of that intros introspection, let's see, uh, let's see where he, a bit of uh, hopefully some sleep and, um, you know, uh, fresh perspective. Uh, what may does bring tomorrow him? bring? Yeah, or or whatever tomorrow means now, right. I suppose. Okay. Oh. Oh. All of that for this. Well, I didn't sleep. No surprises there. And... Things did not go well in my search for food. All I managed was this single box of Hostie's Twinkle Cakes. And I'm sorry to say, but even when you're starving, these things are still completely inedible. <laughs> oh. I mean, I'm sure there was probably more I could have found eventually, but I was interrupted. It would appear my assumption of everything being dead wasn't altogether accurate. That wasn't out long. I had only made it as far as the house down the block, and I probably should have been a little more suspicious of the condition of the front door. You know, something had clearly chewed away at the edge, leaving a decent-sized hole. And truth be told, that's the whole reason I chose it. It seemed like it would be easier to get in, and I was right, but... It definitely turned out that that wasn't exactly the smartest choice. Things weren't nearly as tidy inside that house as they are here. And there was another body and another shattered node, just like you'd expect. But this poor corpse had undergone some additional trauma. Because by the time I got to it, it was in multiple heavily gnawed pieces that had been scattered around the family room. It was pretty obvious that something had tried to make a meal of it after the node had had its share. And I figured whatever had made that hole in the door had either chewed its way in to get to it or chewed its way out after. And either way, I assumed whatever it was, it had long since gone. But I was wrong. I had just started exploring the pantry and I had gotten as far as this single sad little box of snack cakes before I heard something moving around upstairs. And it didn't take me long to figure out that what I was hearing was a dog's nails clicking on a wooden floor. And as it turns out, it wasn't only a rather large dog, it was an unfriendly one, or at least a really hungry one. And it barreled down the stairs once it realized I was there, and it probably would have gotten the better of me if it wouldn't have been for a nearby stool. I smacked it pretty hard with that. 
Luckily, that stunned it long enough for me to escape back into the family room and close the kitchen door behind me. And that was the end of my time there. I slipped back through the hole in the front door with my disgusting snack cakes and I moved on. But I think that dog's barking had woken the neighborhood because as soon as I was out in the street, I saw a pack of his buddies, about six of them, emerge from behind a parked car. And I can't be sure, but I'd almost swear their eyes were not right. You know, they looked like they were glowing, but not like a dog's eyes usually do. Not like they were reflecting light. It was like they were emitting it. I guess I should be used to this kind of thing by now, but I'm not. And I don't know if I ever will be. Anyway, I barely made it back here in one piece. They were closing fast, and I'm pretty sure they're still out there, just waiting for me to be stupid enough to go back out. And I don't know what I'm going to do about that. I mean, I clearly need something more than twinkle cakes, but I can't let my search for food end up with me being eaten instead. Yeah, I'm going to have to look for something around here to protect myself with before I go back out. I'm going to go do that now. Okay. Hmm. Well, it appears that uh, the effect extends beyond just humans. Indeed, indeed. But I had found it interesting upon hearing this that this is the first mention of any other kind of life. He he mentions life in this area and being... um, different than his assumption with the appearance of this dog and then, of course, the uh, The, the pack pack of dogs. Um, But if you recall, when he had left Gar's car ran out of gas, he's walking two hours home. Mm -hmm. Uh, He mentions the clear absence of of any sign of life anywhere. But here we have something. Now, clearly, there is the definite sense with the shattered nodes that uh, whatever's going on with the Mater node has been happening here as well. Right. Now we have to wonder, uh, just as we, we assume that that he and these these tapes were from another universe that right. came, in, into, came ours. into ours, that's, ours. that's what the right. evidence is pointing to. Um, uh, we have to wonder if when he went through the fog, he did indeed cross through a threshold and went into this new universe, one very close to, to his and, mm-hmm. and to ours, but, but not but, quite but the same. But not either, right. And yet... There are shattered nodes here, and so uh, we are left to um, assume that whatever brought about the apocalypse in right. his in his uh, universe, in his world, uh, if the thing behind that hasn't also done a number on on this new this, world this in which he finds end. himself. Not exactly in the same way, mm-hmm. maybe. Uh, we don't know. We how don't know. Widespread, uh, and and also, of course, how many universes did he pass through? There's no way to know, I don't think. But. Yeah, ex- exactly. Uh, and, and you know, we had these questions about this uh, uh, about this mystery and its implications and its, its potential horror, mm-hmm. whether or not something followed him through. Right. But Jack is not currently in danger, but he's on the edge of it. And I think we should jump back in and see uh, just how he addresses this new concern. Mm-hmm. I think I might be in real trouble here. My dog problem is much worse than I thought. After I made that last recording, I did like I said. I started looking for weapons I could use in my search for food. But I wasn't really having much luck because I couldn't quite work out what one actually uses to fend off a pack of wild dogs. But I was determined to find something. And then I looked out the window, and that's when I realized that it was a fool's errand anyway, because the number of dogs salivating outside had easily doubled in a matter of minutes, and more came soon after that. Now there are what I could conservatively call dozens, and they have completely surrounded the house. And any hope I had initially of waiting them out is entirely dead. At this point, it's been at least two days, maybe longer, and they still haven't given up. I don't even have to look outside anymore to know that they're still there. It's like I can feel their glowing eyes scanning the grounds just looking for me. 
I also had to abandon my hovel in the garage because any hint of noise I made was instantly answered with claws and teeth thrashing against that roll-up door. So I had to move back into the main part of the house. I wanted to put a little more wall between me and them. But they know I'm still here. I'm under siege, and I need food and drinkable water soon. Otherwise, I'm not going to make it much longer. And you know, as pathetic as it sounds, I can't seem to help but feel a distinct sense of rejection in all of this. Like I've been forsaken and just left to perish after all this by those I was completely convinced had some kind of grand plan for me. And maybe I was wrong. Maybe there never was any plan, and this was all just some kind of twisted version of wishful thinking. Because if there is a plan, I don't see how any of this could possibly be in service to it. I don't know. Maybe there was a plan before, but they've since given up on me. Maybe I've already dismally failed at it, and in response, they've just quietly moved on. But even if that is the case, even if I have ceased to matter to them, my goal hasn't ceased to matter to me. I still want my answer, my confrontation with my assailants. Anyway, I've now realized that there is no way around the fact that I'm going to have to do something desperate if I'm going to get out of this, and I'm not entirely confident that it's going to work. So, if this is the last time you hear from me, you'll know how I met my end. I've done everything I can to leave a record behind. I don't know how much value that has in a world devoid of people, but it's all I could do. So... I guess this may be goodbye. Thanks for listening. Huh. Jack seems to be frustrated by the notion that whatever it is out there, uh, whatever it is that seemed to have this plan, has given up on him. Um, but given the glowing eyes of these dogs... Yes. You know, I, I'm thinking those aren't really dogs or, or or not only dogs anyway yes uh so okay so if that's the case if if my theory is correct i think i think jack may be wrong here um i don't think he's been abandoned at all right uh with the glowing eyes we certainly get the sense that these dogs have been transformed uh much in the same way that both are and, and Priscilla had been. Mm-hmm, exactly. Um, and if you remember, Gar and Priscilla were each transformed uh, in, in their own ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, so right. we, we didn't really know for sure. But those of us on the team, uh, w- when we heard this description of the eyes, uh, uh, we were, just like you, thinking that these dogs were uh, uh, changed by the nodes for some greater reason or, or, or maybe even uh, that, that they weren't changed at all, but were actually uh, some other kind of creature. Uh something akin to the spider things masquerading as mm-hmm, dogs. Mm-hmm. But uh, we we just didn't know. Huh. And I suppose the answer to that question will potentially lie in, you know, whatever Jack has to say next. Um, if, that is, Jack does in fact say something next, I mean, as he said, this may be his end. Um, right. And I am, as I'm sure my listeners are as well, keenly interested to know if and how uh, Jack might find his way out of this situation. Uh, oh, but we are, uh, we're, well, we're just going to have to let that question hang in the air for a moment because I'm getting the blue light again from Maggie, which means we need to take another quick break. Um, we will pick this up again when we come back. Great. So, uh, stay tuned folks. We will be right back with more Candle Against the Dark. (laughs) 